Who has seen the movie Surf's Up? It's right up there with the classics, like... Hmm. Like The Sound of Music, Nacho Libre. All right. It's always good to start with the notes. I'll get to the notes in a second. I want to tell you something about Surf's Up. Now, Surf's Up um, is about a move, is, is, is about a surfing penguin. Makes perfect sense. Uh, and his name is Cody. And um, he finds his, his hero, his all-time hero, is, a, is a, the great surfing champion called Big Z. But Big Z kind of fades from, uh, from memory. He, he actually disappears altogether. Uh, and everyone assumes that he's dead. And it so happens that Cody finds him on this island where they're having a massive surfing championship. But Cody comes from Shiverpool, where in the <laughs> Shiverpool, it's it's the, the opposite of Jansenville. So where it's really so he's only served on on ice, you know, as a board, okay. And he needs a surfboard because obviously by the time he gets to this island, his surfboard is melted. He doesn't have one anymore. In the event, he finds Big Z. Big Z is is the ultimate. In surfing, he's the legend. He's the longboard guy that can just stand there all day long and it just let the wave do the work. But Big Z is not really the. He's a great teacher because he's got all the knowledge, but he, but he's not really ready to let go. Cody, on the other hand, is like a super excited Jack Russell, but he's not all that teachable. Just keep that in mind. Back to Romans, <laughs> chapter 12. So, um, Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8 says, We have different gifts by the grace given us. And if someone's great gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouragement or bringing encouragement, let him encourage. It makes a lot of sense. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is bringing encouragement, let him encourage. And so as you might have known that uh, we are busy and we are in the series of the grace gifts, we're looking at these, at these gifts as Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And um, today we're going to look at two of them together. We're going to look at teaching and encouragement. And so we'll focus at, uh, on, on both of those today. So we're going to open up with a quick question. Who here has had at least one, probably more, but at least one absolutely outstanding, great, brilliant, awesome teacher at school? Excellent. I'm not going to ask where you were at school, Durrell, but um, Okay. I'm willing to bet that teacher was also a great encourager, a passionate person that would speak and spit and, I don't know, do things to the pupils <laughs> to get them excited as he is excited. We had such an incredible Afrikaans teacher. I'm not going to tell you about him. It's a great guy. Can I quickly see, second question, who in their top three gifts has encouragement or teaching in your, in your top three? Whoa, can, you, can you just raise up your hands again because this is really encouraging. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm looking forward to a great morning of great encouragement. I probably can, can just sit down and watch some of that great movie. Uh, because everyone is on the same page already. Um, you see that um, with, with, with a great teacher, if we, we can be great teachers, but with, without that gift of encouragement working together, we, um, we won't often 
get that stirring, and, and we won't actually move people to the place where God actually wants them. There's, a, there's an interdependence between these gifts. I'm, I quite bet that a number of you who came up with, as your top three, teaching or encouragement, were quite surprised by that. Okay. Who had, uh, who, I'm not going to ask who was surprised, that's fine. Who is really good at breathing? You see, it's one of those things that sometimes it comes so naturally that you're good at it without even noticing. And you might be a really good teacher or a really good encourager without even noticing, but somebody else is noticing. Somebody else feels encouraged. Somebody else feels lifted up when you leave the room. Oh, no, that's sort of what I mean. It's <laughs> because of you having been there, they feel encouraged. Others, yeah, when you leave, they, 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 then they're encouraged. But that's not for this church. That's for back in Yonsonville. Some people are, are great sounding boards. Others are great springboards. You know, just launching you into your full potential. But so let's quickly have a, a look at the definitions. I want to uh, make sure that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about teaching and encouragement. So teaching would be the gathering of information, not necessarily formally. It could be formally through um, research, but, but also just in life, picking up experience. And then passing on, communicating that information to others in a helpful manner for their good. So gathering information and then passing it on, teaching in some way, practicing, uh, showing, communicating that, instilling that into somebody else in a helpful way for their good. And when I said in a helpful way, I had a flashback to uh, my dad teaching me how to drive. That's not necessarily a, <laughs> happened in a helpful way. So I'm not going to tell the story. I'm going to try and focus on these, on these notes of mine. All right, so teachers. If you're wondering whether you're, you're a teacher, um, these are some of the signs. Teachers are inquisitive. They have an inquiring mind. They often ask questions. They very often have the irritating habit of interrupting people because with another question. Just as, as you, just one more question. Because they, they want to know. But they also have a gift, you see. And their gift is to take complex situations or complex concepts and to break that down into understandable, manageable chunks. To actually get it into bite sized chunks to help people to get it. They are the guys that bring about that aha moment. Ah, now I have it. Einstein said, if you cannot explain it to a six-year-old, it's probably because you do not understand it yourself. Bring about the aha moments. These are the teachers. Encourage us. Very simple. It's the ability to build someone up, to bring hope, and to bring about courage. Now, when you're on top of the world, you don't need all that much courage. But it's during the tough times, it's during the rough seasons, it's during the dark moments that you need encouraging. That's the moment that you actually don't need the sounding board, but you actually need the springboard. Encourage us, fill us with courage during times when things are tough and it seems dark. When we think about teachers, this is part of the problem. Because a number of you had the, the, the teaching gift as one of, from the assessment as one of your gifts. But you don't quite agree with that necessarily because you don't quite see yourself as a teacher. And the reason why is that when you think of a teacher, you think of somebody on a platform, or in front of a class, or there's a lectern, or there's a microphone involved, there's a, an audience, there's a crowd, there's a whole lot of people listening. In Nehemiah chapter 8, they find the, the book of the law, and they put up a, a massive structure, and they put Ezra the priest on top, and he teaches the people. 
And there's the entire nation. And so that's the picture we have. We have scrolls. We have a recognized teacher. We have a, a raised platform, and we have a whole crowd of people. So that's our understanding. And this is why we so often disqualify ourselves as a teacher, because when I say something, there's, there's no crowd. There's no stage. There's no microphone. It's just kind of, I just kind of drop helpful hints here and there, and it seems to make life easier for people. See, that's where we get it wrong. Jesus is always the, the ultimate example. And when we think of him as a teacher, what do we think about? We think about the Sermon on the Mount, don't we? Where he's teaching thousands of people once again. And again, we're back, back to the same example of, yes, he's up there on the, on, the, on the hillside, and he's teaching, and there's a crowd but Jesus spent much more time with the 12 than with the crowd. And then there were those wonderful, beautiful moments we had the one-on-ones. And he had many one-on-ones. Just think of, of John chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the middle of the night. And he gets a brilliant teaching on what it means to be born again. To the extent that Jesus says to him, and you are a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand this very elementary thing, let's have a moment of teaching one-on-one. -on -one. And so when we see Jesus in action, when we understand that it's not about the crowds necessarily, interesting, whenever there were crowds around, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law were also hanging around on the outskirts, also kind of listening in. How many of them were affected by the teaching of Jesus? How many of them were actually converted by the teaching of Jesus? What about Nicodemus? Was he affected? If you rewind back, you'll see that the one who came with Joseph of Arimathea when they took the body of Jesus from the cross with some spices. It says, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Let's move on. So when it comes to teaching, I want us to firstly have the understanding that we, we break down this concept that Unless it's a crowd of people that I'm talking to, unless I have a microphone, unless I'm on the stage, I'm not a teacher at all. Even a six-year-old can teach a four-year-old how to tie their shoes. In fact, most six-year-olds can teach me quite a bit regarding technology. But when it comes to teaching, Paul writes to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy... Chapter 2, verse 2, he says to him, And the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, tell these, or instruct these, um, entrust, entrust this to reliable men who will be able, who will be qualified to also teach others. The things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust this to reliable men, to other teachers, perhaps, who will be able to convey it to others. We'll be qualified to teach others. We need normal, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety teachers like all of us, not mere know-it-all teachers, but teachers who actually want to impart their knowledge, who want to release what they have, and then also to release those to whom they have released it. Do you get that? Teachers who want to release what they've gathered to others, but also then to release them, to run with what they've received. Not quite like Big Z.
thing about Big Z. <laughs> so it's not quite ready to, to hand over yet. In fact, that, that clip has a, a last second or so where as soon as Cody takes the tool, the shell from him, as soon as he touches the wood, he grabs it and says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> anyway. So on the one hand, what we need is, is teachers who, who has all the experience, all the knowledge, but it also is ready to release. On the other hand, we need, let's call it students, the, the next generation coming through with, with all that zeal, with all the passion, but who actually want to learn. People, students who, who want to learn, who are not know-it-all, unteachable ignoramuses. Cody being unteachable. Right, I trust that was incredibly helpful. <laughs> okay, so on the one hand, when it comes to teaching, we need great teachers who want to impart the skill. On the other, other hand, we just need people who, need, who are teachable and can actually receive. Time is, time is precious. And so when we're going to be imparting what we have, we need some discernment, we, especially when it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. When we're going to limit ourselves to an hour a day or an hour a week with someone on a one-to-one -one basis, we, we need to really make sure that this person is the right candidate. So we need some discernment. Who do you think of the following two, on the face of it, would be the better candidate to have as a student, especially on a one-to-one -one basis? A young man, rich, already well-educated, keen to Learn from the best. Not only to get there for a, for a pass mark, but actually wanting to pass magna cum laude. The Oxford boy, on the one hand. Or a girl with not much of a background, bordering on being the village floozy, coming to fetch some water. The Kliplard girl. Well, as you know, the rich young ruler had his one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, the Oxford boy. But he went away sad. While the lady from this little village in Samaria had her one-on-one -on -one with Jesus at the well, jumped up, ran back to the village, and converted the entire village with her testimony of the Messiah. I wonder if she was a teacher. Was she an encourager? Maybe she was an evangelist. Fortunately, it doesn't matter because it works interdependently. Moving on to encouragement. It's all about the ability to see the possibilities, to, to find the gold and then to mine the gold. Changing people's perspective, their view, their angle, their attitude on the situation. Now, it's not mindless denial or, or mind over matter stuff, but it very often involves the ability to not overlook the God factor. And so, just two examples from the Old Testament. The one is where God promises to the Israelites their own land, a promised land, a great land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And so Moses, the leader on the ground, decides, as you know, to choose to select 12 leaders, one from each tribe, the man from each tribe. He would have probably been better off choosing the encourager from each tribe. Because as they come back, they give such a bad report. Ten of the twelve give such a bad report that the people are completely discouraged and said, in fact, that they melted with fear and they were at a place where they wanted to select a leader to take them back to the land of captivity. They actually wanted to turn back to Egypt. On the other hand, Second picture, we find King Saul and the army of Israel facing for quite some time by, by this time now, as we come into this moment, the army of the Philistines. And during this time, we find that from 1 Samuel 17 verse 11, we see that the mood in the camp is rather glum. On hearing the Philistines' words, this is, obviously Goliath's words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Dismayed and terrified. That's quite the opposite of encouraged, which means to be filled with courage. Dismayed and terrified equals not to be filled with courage. But then David arrives on the scene with basically carrying sandwiches and a Stanley flask for the brothers. Now as he's coming onto the battlefield, it's time for Goliath to do his daily routine. He has been doing this for a while now. And um, so David overhears this. It says from verse 23 to verse seven, uh, 25, as he was talking with him, this is David with his brothers and the others, Goliath, the, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out of the lines and he shouted his normal defiance to the Israelites. And David overheard it. And when the Israelites saw the man, they ran in great fear. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see this man keep coming out? He comes out to defy the armies of Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage. And he will exempt his entire family from paying taxes in Israel. You would have had me at being exempt from taxes. In any event... perspective. When everyone else, including King Saul, were of the opinion that Goliath was simply too big to kill. David's perspective was that he's too big to miss. The one lot is of the, pers of, of the perspective of the opinion that he's too big to kill. This is impossible, excluding the God factor. David reckons he, he really is too, miss, too big to miss. It's, it's like a barn door. So it's the same reality, but there's a whole different perspective. There's a whole different angle. So why is this? How is it possible that we can be, that they can be in the same spot at the same time, having this, the, the same reality, but having different perspectives? You see, the answer lies in where David was. David had just come in, from spending time in the fields with the sheep, with God. David had been spending time with God on his own, while the Israelites had been sitting under the drip-feeding poison of Goliath for, as it says, the last 40 days. For 40 days, they've been drip-fed his poison. So no wonder they were terrified and dismayed. David came in, from the presence of God. So what you are exposed to will determine your perspective. What you are exposed to and what you are exposing yourself to on a daily basis, drip feeding yourself with on a daily basis will determine your perspective. What you allow in will eventually come out. In Acts chapter 4, just to show that this didn't end in the Old Testament, in Acts chapter 4, verse 5 to 7, we have this text. Just the context, it's Acts chapter 4 comes after, 
Acts chapter 3, correct. And so in Acts chapter 3, what happens? Acts chapter, Acts chapter 3 opens up with, at the time of prayer, the disciples, Peter and John, went to the temple. At the gate, beautiful, they saw the beggar. All right, you know the rest of the story. And so now they are being called in to give an account. So the next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, unless the high priest was there. So also Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men from the high priest's family. The high Peter and John brought before them, began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? This is obviously now referring to the healing of the cripple at the gate beautiful. Well, if this is not an intimidating crowd, <laughs> then I'm not sure who he is. But let's see the response. If we look at verse 8 to verse 13. Then Peter, full with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called here today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, Last week we heard of random acts of kindness. If we are being called to account today for showing mercy, and we are being asked of how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people, it is by the name, remember they asked the question, by what name or what power? It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, this man stands before you healed. Jesus, and now he moves from the name, not only the name, but he comes to the power and the authority. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For the, there is no other name under heaven given by which men shall be saved. And when they saw the what? When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were normal, unschooled men. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. When they saw their courage, they took note that these men, although normal, unschooled, they had been with Jesus. It takes us back to the question, who or what you are exposed to will determine your expectation and your perspective. Who or what you're exposed to will change or determine your perspective. What we see is determined by who we see. What we see is determined by who we see. There's an interesting scripture in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, 25 to 27. What we see is determined by who we see. In this scripture, Jesus comes to the disciples. He's been praying up in the mountain. They're on the lake, and he's walking towards them on the water. And immediately they freak out because they are shouting that it is a ghost. What you see will determine who you see. It is a ghost, and they are terrified. But Jesus immediately said to them, it is I. Take courage, firstly. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. What you see, who you see, who you see will determine what you see. Is it the ghost? Is it something terrifying? Or is it, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And the next moment, Peter is out of the boat and he's also walking on water. Is it not time to change who we see, and not only what we see, so we can get out the boat and walk on the water. It's not always possible to be encouraged by somebody else. It's not always possible for someone else to come in and fill me with the courage that I need. Quite often, actually, we need to be able to encourage ourselves, to dig deep within ourselves, not actually within ourselves, to dig deep into ourselves and find the God deposit that He has placed within us and to encourage ourselves. There's a, a beautiful story in uh, 1 Samuel 30 verse 6. 
the, the run-up to this is that um, David went, went out with the Philistines, yes, with them. He was turned back, and as they came back to the, the, the place where they lived, they had been attacked by another tribe, and everything has been taken. So David and his men comes back, and their, their place has been completely looted, and wives, children, everything has been taken. And suddenly the men, David's own men, turn on him, and he can hear the conspiracies happening, and they are talking about stoning him. They are going to kill David because he is the cause of all of this. It says that David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each was bitter in spirit because of his own sons and daughters that were carried off. But David found strength in the Lord his God. David had nowhere to go. He had no shrink to go and see. He couldn't make a call. He couldn't phone a friend. He had to dig deep within himself, within the deposit that God had made. He went probably uh, in, into isolation for a moment, onto his knees in a quiet place, connected with a God whom he knew so well, the God with whom he slayed the bear and the lion and Goliath and so many other things. And he found courage. He encouraged himself in God. We need to regularly strengthen ourselves in God by seeing ourselves through the eyes of the Creator. We have, get ready for that third clip, please. We have the ability to look at ourselves and see our own insignificance. We look at ourselves and we see one grain of sand on an entire beach. And we need to develop the incredible ability to look at ourselves through the eye of the Creator and to see our purpose in His big plan unfold. Let's watch this quickly.
we started, Tim spoke about John 10, verse 10. Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came to give us life. Give us life in all of its abundance. Who are we looking at? Where is our focus? What do we see? And what we see is determined by who we see. The stealing of a supply. I'm going to cut out a section because I've run out of time. But I want to close with 1 Samuel chapter 16. The very well known. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So, if you've never taught a class before, then you're obviously not a teacher. If you've never, never shared a public word of encouragement that brought about peace, you're obviously not an encourager. To quote the original Greek, Fleur used it recently, but today I want to use it in the, the past perfect participle, as found in most of the ancient manuscripts. Utter rubbish. <laughs> Not just a rubbish. Utter rubbish. If you think that you need a class to be a teacher, I've learned nothing from this morning. <laughs> if you think that you need to bring about world peace by one statement of great encouragement, you've missed it. Let's look at our lives through the heaven's eyes. You see, there's much more to you than meets the eye. You have a gift. You are unique. We use our gifts and our uniqueness in interdependence. And we grow as we step out in them. Can we stand, please? We have the, the gift and the opportunity to teach. Let's teach Jesus. Let's have him as our subject. If we have the opportunity to encourage, let's encourage by pointing towards Jesus. This morning I want to ask anyone and everyone who needs some form of encouragement, whether whatever the circumstances is. But in your current circumstances, you can, do, you can do with a touch of encouragement. I'd love for you to come out because there's a whole crowd that wants to come and fill you with courage.